Sanctions is an issue that the RIPNCC has been grappling with uh, for a number of years now, um, but one that's become very urgent in, in the last um, couple of years where we've seen the, the use of sanctions really grow and become much more prevalent and, and have to consider the implications as they apply to the global internet. Um, we have a panel here today which I think wants to consider what those implications are, what the impact on the global internet is, um, the way sanctions are being used and, and um, how they're being developed, and then hopefully to look towards some solutions, uh, ways that we could actually tip the needle in a direction where we minimize those risks or that, je that jeopardy for the global internet. Um, we have also a presentation from Fazane Badi, who is doing a research project currently um, funded by the RIPNCC, but looking into more broadly how uh, sanctions affect the internet. And so that's a really important foundational piece of information um, on which we hope to build this discussion and hopefully find some solutions. Um, I will also just quickly um, introduce our panel. Um, we have Natalie Yasma with us here from the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, Cyber Ambassador at Large. Is that the, the correct title? So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have Alexander Savnin, who is uh, in civil society from Russia. Um, David Bekeli from ISOC. David, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your surname there, but um, thank you for joining us. Um, Jane Coffin, who is working for uh, and, you know, Connect Humanity Fund, um, uh, but has a very long history um, in both government and technical community. So thank you, Jane. Um, and sorry, Natalia Fodic, um, who is working in the academic space um, in, in Latin America. So Natalia, very good to have you with us as well. Um, I think that's everyone, yes. Um, so with that introduction complete, uh, I would like to invite Fazane to um, give us the summary of the work that she's been doing and set the stage for further discussions here. So thanks for that, Fazane. Everybody, can you hear me? Yes. No? Yes. Okay. Good. Can you see my slides? Like the purple, nice thing there. No. Also, yes, but you might want to hit play on the slide deck. <laughs> oh, hit play. I guess I just have to do this. Yeah. All right. Well, can you see this? I think that will do. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Chris said, my name is Farzan Abadi, and uh, I'm the founder of Digital Medusa, and this research is funded by RIPE NCC. Uh, so we're talking about sanctions and the global internet. Um, I'm... So the next slide is... Okay. So... Um, so I'm doing this research not alone with a team of people, Andrew Rehuela and uh, Jenny Ryan Penn and Laura Wilke, which their amazing contributions uh, made this research possible. Now the objective of the research is uh, how to, uh, to find out and discover how sanctions affect the internet and uh, do they endanger uh, the global internet and access to the global internet in, uh, in any way and how we can mitigate the impact. Um, so it's very important to make this distinction between cyber sanctions and economic sanctions because uh, we keep hearing that um, that what what is the difference and are we talking about not sanctioning cyber attackers and that is not the case cyber sanctions are imposed after a malicious attack uh, attributed to the cyber attacker and it is a legitimate state response uh, to cyber attack uh, while economic sanctions might not uh, be internet uh, specific uh, but they have unintended uh, consequences for the internet 
and generally not in a response to a foreign uh, cyber attack. So what are these economic uh, sanctions? Um, so these economic sanctions are like trade and uh, financial bar uh, barriers that uh, some nation states impose on other nation states in the conflict to, um, uh, to stop the na nation sta uh, state from attacking uh, others or um, violate human rights or, uh, 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 or to counter terrorism. So economic sanctions are not new and they have had implications for the internet since the late 90s. And the uh, regime most of the time is not internet specific, but it affects the internet. And the implications for the internet have been increasing in the past decade. And, uh, but from early on, we see that there have been sanction relief when it comes to the internet to uh, ease sanctions for access uh, with like li license issuing licenses, exemption, derogations, and regulations. Okay, so this is a timeline. I'm not going to go through uh, every uh, everything, but um, just in um, 2001, when the uh, US and uh, uh, the 9-11 terrorist attack happened, uh, the US um, came up with a a very organized answer to uh, sanctioning the terrorists and kind of uh, the Treasury, the, uh, the Office of uh, Treasury had a very um, uh, had, a, had a very strong response to uh, uh, to financial uh, sanctions, to putting financial uh, sanctions on state uh, terrorist states and terrorist groups. And uh, but they uh, came up with a, a plan that it's called like smart sanctions, which means that uh, it can be country specific, uh, but it can also be individual and uh, entity specific in order to, to kind of not to impact ordinary people. Uh, since to, uh, from between 2001 to 2010, it doesn't mean that. Uh, it, these sanctions didn't affect the internet. It's just that we are in the uh, process of research. Uh, but there have been like a few reported cases about the country code top level domain um, uh, de a delegation in, in 2005, I believe, and a few others until uh, 2010 that the um, uh, that. Uh, the Iranian uprising uh, happened and uh, U.S. saw that what sort of uh, impact the sanctions have on Iranians and Cubans um, for their access to the internet. So they came up with, um, uh, they came up with a, a few like reliefs for personal communication that happened on the internet. And then we have in 2011, um, uh, there, there are like reports that Cuba cannot um, develop its inter uh, internet because of the US san uh, sanctions again. Um, and then we have in 2012, the EU uh, sanctions that were imposed before in 2007, but they have like a direct effect uh, on the internet uh, this time on internet governance or organizations and they had to uh, reinsure that they are in compliance with these sanctions. I'm not going to go through all of this, but we see, uh, as uh, as you can see, um, uh, uh, we see a kind of like increase in uh, sanctions, especially as geopolitical uh, conflicts are uh, increasing. And uh, the re uh, the most recent one was the um, UK, EU, and the US uh, sanctions that were imposed on uh, Russia because of uh, the, because of the war it waged on uh, on Ukraine. And uh, that had uh, a few implications. Uh, we might see some implications on Afghanistan um, as well. And uh, if you want to see the timeline, uh, you can go either to my website or this uh, sanctions timeline here. Um, okay, uh, so categorizing the impact. Uh, what sort of uh, impacts um, sanctions have had. So there's the effect on regional internet registries, um, there is the inequitable act, uh, access to number of resources, there is 
also impact of sanctions on network oper uh, operators um, and then also impact of sanctions on the domain name uh, system and the domain name uh, registration. Uh, so the impacts on RIRs, uh, right NCC has been very vocal about this and they have uh, done a fantastic job of informing us of what is going on, but uh, in, in general, uh, in our um, discussions with other uh, RIRs, we have come up with these um, uh, with these impacts like transferring from one RIR to another is difficult, uh, payment systems, um, uh, payment systems uh, uh, because of lack of access to pay, uh, payment systems or because payment systems are sanctioned, they cannot pay for the IP addresses and um, and also there is an impact on local internet registries because uh, if because when local internet registries sponsor sanctioned uh, 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 sanctioned entities, they are uh, they uh, ripe NCC or other uh, RIRs, they still uh, have to comply with the law and they, they cannot, they have to just um, keep their IP addresses registered. So, and uh, here we go with the, my slides today are not spot on. Okay. So um, the impact on the network uh, operators, uh, uh, we have had, uh, we have had quite a discussion with uh, network operators and also like did some research on uh, a few uh, and then, uh, a few I, when ISPs were sanctioned, and in in general, when a specific sanction applied to individuals with former roles in telecommunication services, um, then uh, for example, in the, if they are a member of an internet exchange point, then that internet exchange point has to uh, revoke their mem the membership of the sanctioned uh, entity. So it might be that the entity is not sanctioned, but somebody, a CEO or a board member is sanctioned. And uh, the, uh, for example, in case of peering, um, the internet exchange point cannot have that entity as their uh, as their member, and this was a recent case. Uh, there was the London Internet Exchange that um, revoked the membership of Russia, uh, uh, Russian telecom uh, operators, uh, Ross Telecom and Megaphone. And then uh, the network operator is large, serves uh, can serve uh, other like smaller network operators that can be affected, and also network operators that are sanctioned might carry internet traffic from other non-sanctioned countries that those countries that are not sanctioned get uh, affected as well because of um, uh, because of this revocation of uh, the membership. Okay, so I don't have much time, I think. So uh, let me uh, just uh, talk about um, concretely about the impact on network operators. We are still in the process of uh, we are still in the process of uh, collecting feedback, but at the moment we see that as well as depearing, network operator is what uh, might not be able um, uh, might not be able to like be a part of an internet exchange point, and uh, other network uh, operators might not want to peer with them, and this will um, the, uh, this will affect their. Um, internet traffic, it doesn't it doesn't disconnect them from the internet as such that it uh, kind of affects the quality of access to the internet. And then um, and, and then we also like have the cache servers um, a case that uh, in Russia, uh, a few of the uh, cache uh, servers reportedly were um, uh, were deactivated because of uh, sanctions. We also have a, a few reports about uh, in Afghanistan that this has happened. Um, and, uh, and for the cache servers, uh, cache servers uh, allow for like easier and more accessible and a faster download of uh, content. So it is it is important. So if it depends on which country and how well connected the country uh, uh, is. If you uh, if you have a country like Afghanistan and you take like their two cache servers away, that would affect their access to um, uh, to content on online. And then we have to talk about like domain name registration. I don't want to, I, how much time do I have, Chris? 
Um, You're okay. I think you've got a few more minutes and we'll, we're working with it. All right. Okay. So then we have the, um, then we have the domain name uh, registration uh, problems that um, that people have been dealing with and and why people I mean people who are not sanctioned just ordinary people who live in sanctioned uh, countries. Uh, so uh, there was the Sudan CCTL Reads delegation uh, some years ago, which uh, faced some uh, hurdles, uh, and then um and the iran and syria lack of access to new gtlds uh for example um uh for uh, for example there are a few cases that uh new gtld operators just um uh, just confiscate or uh suspend their do the domain names of people in iran because they have a direct contract with these uh, with the Iranians uh, and uh, with the, with the Syrians, and they uh, they believe that compliance wise they should not have. And there is also the case of .dot Asia and .dot NGO that uh, they don't allow uh, sanctioned countries um, to do, uh, register domain names there. And then also a few registrars uh, stopped supporting clients and users from Iran, Sudan, Syria. And Sudan is an uh, older case. Um, and uh, so this was, and then well, when we uh, when we discussed this and during our research, we also talked about uh, what can we do uh, in order to prov uh, provide solutions. Um, so for example, we can have more multilateral and bilateral arrangements for uh, governments to coordinate with each other. Uh, when they are imposing sanction, because uh, the internet is such an um, uh, interconnected network of networks that uh, that uh, if you sanction uh, some in one jurisdiction, it can have an effect on others. Uh, so it could be that bilateral and multilateral arrangement for governments to coordinate and prevent adverse effect of sanctions. It could be issuing licenses, exemption, derogations, uh, processes to review and revise sanctions. And, um, and also like the companies and organizations can have a more transparent and compliant process. Uh, uh, that uh, doesn't overcomply with sanction, uh, but uh, uh, also provide the minimum uh, uh, minimum services for the internet. Uh, and then uh, we can convene a cross industry coalition because uh, because the internet has been formalized and uh, there are but however the, uh, so there are many other actors who are involved. Uh, however, they don't understand and don't engage with that multi-stakeholder uh, governance model of the internet. So um, if we can talk to other actors who are not directly involved with the provision of uh, the internet and explain the situation, perhaps it would uh, prevent them from over complying with these sanctions and then the mapping the internet value chain and uh, use of our the existing uh, IG fora, such as Freedom uh, Online Coalition and others. Sorry, thank you. I think uh, so. If you want to get in touch with us, uh, that's the information. Uh, also, if you want to give us feedback, uh, you can just scan that QR code. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fazani. That's, uh, I think, a really useful starting point and, and gives an indication of how complex the impacts are and on how many elements in the internet technical um, infrastructure. Turning, I guess, a little to the other side of that equation and government and the sort of the, the sanction process, um, I'm turning to Natalie Yasma now. And just, I, I, it would be really interesting to get your impression of how sanctions and the use of sanctions are impacting on your, your work and your discussions around global internet governance, in, internet governance in the UN, et cetera. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you also for inviting me on the panel. Um, I very much welcome this uh, discussion. Um, I'm indeed the um, cyber ambassador of the Netherlands, and um, 
we have been advocating for an open, free, safe, secure, interoperable, interoperable internet for a long time. So, of course, when there are uh, unintended consequences of certain policy measures, we need to look at them. So, when it's about sanctions, first of all, uh, Fazani, thank you for making this distinction between cyber sanctions and economic sanctions, more general. Um, I think sanctions in general are a legitimate foreign policy tool. It's usually in reaction to um, behavior by another government that is not behaving in line with its commitments, um, with international law, with um, sort of agreements that they have signed on to. So, um, what is the toolbox of another government to hold that government accountable? Well, think about that, then sanctions is one of the few tools. So it is a legitimate foreign policy tool. Um, as, I've, as I said, um, we've been advocating for an open, free, safe and secure uh, internet for a long time, and uh, but we've also been advocating for the protection of the public core of the internet. And why is that? That was because uh, we actually had a wake-up call in terms of cybersecurity in 2013, when one of our, um, uh, well, when basically the um, cryptography layer was uh, was being uh, hampered or fiddled with. Um, and so basically we've been working on the concept of this public core. And what we mean with this is really the technical layer of the internet. So like the naming, the routing, the numbering and the cr cryptography. And uh, we've been advocating in the UN to actually um, don't attack that um, public core. And we've advocated for that successfully. It's part of the normative framework that we that all UN member states have uh, signed up to. Um, and this is the normative framework on responsible state behavior on ICTs. Um, but then this is about um, sort of the protection of the public core. But then, of course, there's the other issue, and that is that we've been advocating for the governance of the public core, that that should be done in a multi-stakeholder way. Well, this is a long introduction for saying that um, within the uh, area of sanctions, which, which is dealt with in an other area than sort of the, the cyber uh, silo, um, these sanctions are usually uh, coming about under a lot of time pressure because there is something going on in a country and another country wants to react to that. Um, it, sanctions are, in our view, um, really a mean to change the behavior of another country. So there is really a time uh, sensitive uh, part to it. So that means that if things are coming about under pressure, then the impact is not always uh, sort of looked at in a very complete and comprehensive way. Um, and what we have um, and, and then sort of coming down, coming back to sort of the public core, and when we look at uh, also the research that uh, Fazani just presented, then of course it doesn't make sense to us, as the Netherlands, but I think for a lot of governments, to deprive um, citizens from their access to the internet um, while we are trying to send a message to another government. And so that is something that we need to um, sort of take into consideration in a better way. So, um, and we've been looking at this as Dutch government, uh, also sort of doing our homework in terms of looking at the different sanction regimes. And then it's not so clear cut. It's the world is never black and white, I think. Um, so then I've come to uh, sort of an, an, an initial conclusion that we can probably not uh, come to sort of an overall clear-cut exemption. Because there are always uh, sort of situations where you would say, okay, now the owner of a certain entity is being sanctioned. Um, 
and you still want to uh, have that possibility but that having said I think that our people and in in our case that is people in Brussels um, because sanctions that um, we are actually uh, imposing are uh, discussed in the context of the European Union so it's all the European Union uh, uh, countries and uh, so our people in Brussels need to have a better understanding of how the internet works what the players are and what kind of considerations they have to take into account when they are imposing sanctions and so it's really sort of bridging these silos in our uh, systems to uh, to make that happen um, and um, just also to to say a little bit something about how we became more aware uh, well I think RIPE NCC has been actively sort of knocking on our d door for a long time already but more sort of uh, with our sanction people but with the um, uh, one of the first sanction packages against Russia um, no, it was actually, uh, yeah, during that time. Then the government of Ukraine requested ICANN and RIPE NCC to remove the .ru domain. And of course, um, like RIPE NCC and ICANN are not, are not in the business of removing any domains. They're in the business of uh, preserving the worldwide internet. So they took... Um, in our opinion the right decision uh, and um, not removing the .ru domain but we also had a this, this also started a debate within our uh, system and um, which I think was a very healthy debate because then um, also sort of our political leaders understood the relevance of keeping the internet open for all and that that is really relevant for um, all citizens around around the world and uh, that is one element but also um, with this extreme request um, we would never be able to predict the unintended consequences and of course nobody wants to be responsible for sort of unintended consequences leading to whatever kind of incidents at hospitals or, or other um, really important services for uh, uh, for people um, one perhaps one last uh, observation is that within sort of the sanction domain we do have more sort of general exemptions and that's usually based on humanitarian reasons and I think that could be an area to look at sort of the, the language that is being used there and to see um, how we can sort of um, make a similar approach on, um, um, yeah, on, on the sanctions that have unintended consequences uh, on the internet. Great, thank you very much, Natalie. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you. You're starting to move into what I'm hoping this workshop will provide, which is the beginnings of a sort of solution, or at least a, a, a step towards um, mitigating these risks in the future. Um, I want to turn now to Jane Coffin um, for a little bit, I guess, more contextual, um, stepping out of the European context there, but um, as I mentioned in the opening, Jane bringing a wealth of experience from both government and the technical community. Um, so Jane, great to hear from you. Yes, thank you very much, Chris, and hello to everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'll tell you a little story or part of a story related to sanctions and um, sort of what were happy consequences versus unintended consequences. Um, when I was listening to the cyber ambassador speak, I was thinking sanctions are such a niche area that many nonprofits and many in the internet technical community weren't as aware at, in certain points of our, our, um, our growth as organizations and particularly for many small nonprofits about the impact sanctions can have on you as a small company. <laughs> if you uh, if you violate those sanctions regimes, it can be very expensive and quite a bit of um, complications with your with your national governments. But also, 
they seem often to many people, people are afraid of dealing with the sanctions um, organizations, say OFAC at the Treasury Department. They're lovely people, they do what they do, but if you don't know what to do, you could be quite afraid of, of how, um, how to interface with them. And Chris, that's going to get to a point, I think, at the end of what I say here about a way forward potentially and some recommendations. But um, when I was at the Internet Society, we were, um, we were happy to receive some donations of equipment from an equipment manufacturer for um, helping internet exchange points grow. These would be switches, and sometimes we would send servers as well. Um, these were not highly encrypted pieces of equipment, but if you don't know where you're allowed and not allowed to send even a low encryption um, switch, uh, you can end up violating a sanctions regime with, un without knowing, knowing. So it's unknowingly, you might violate a big rule that could put you in jeopardy as a small company. One, the smaller organizations, nonprofits, don't have the legal teams. They don't have the knowledge. They often don't know how to interface. I was lucky enough to have worked for the U.S. Department of Commerce, where one of the sanctions um, uh, organizations sort of lives. It's the BIS at the Department of Commerce. And I had had the, the good um, offices of having worked at a law firm before that, working with sanctions and embargoes. So I had a bit more scope of work under in my career. When I came to the Internet Society, I was able to bring that with me. If you don't know these things as a small nonprofit and an organization, a technical community that's trying to do good, build out infrastructure, why would I have to check in with anybody <laughs> to take a switch in my suitcase or to send it? Please don't take switches in your suitcases. <laughs> but uh, you do run into challenges. And so this was back, um, we, we knew what to do at the Internet Society when I was there. And I think it's just very important to realize that the IGF is a multi-stakeholder event. People talk to each other from different government offices. We're lucky to have a government official on this panel. We do need to think of ways that the internet community and small nonprofits can interface with sanctions organizations in different countries. How do you approach them without, you know, you sort of triggering something with one of those organizations where they might think you've already done something and you haven't? How do you start to create a better dialogue with those organizations? Because you're not sending usually very um, complicated equipment around the planet. Um, or you could be unknowingly. I mean, back in the day, an iPhone, the, the type of uh, computing in an iPhone would not have been allowed years and years ago when I was first doing work in sanctions and embargo. Um, so I would just say that there's some, um, it's really important um, for people to know what you can and cannot receive, what you can and cannot send. Um, it, it can be a little tricky. And quite frankly, when you're trying to send equipment, this is super practical, you're working with different organizations like FedEx and DHL, which actually have to comply themselves with the sanctions regime um, rules in their own countries, particularly I'm um, thinking of the United States. So often I would have to get on the phone <laughs> with FedEx or DHL. And uh, when you're a small organization, you do the work yourself or you might have someone that can help you do it, but it can be highly time intensive. And then if you do get a license to send the equipment to a certain country, which you didn't think you, you had to, but you do, um, you'll get that license and you'll have a time frame within which you've got to make sure if it expires that you're then working with the sanctions organization, whether it's Treasury in the United States, to uh, ensure that you get that license re-upped. And so you've got to have a good um, program inside your organization. There are very easy tools now that you can use also to check for people's names, because if you're running a big global event, I think Farzana had uh, touched on this a little bit in her research, um, there's something called blocked entities and specially designated nationals um, from the U.S. sanctions regime a program. And if you by accident have somebody who's on that list who attends one of your events, there could be trouble. So all of this is to say there needs to be a bit more, um, a, a more open dialogue on all these issues particularly for nonprofit civil society and the um, internet technical community with their own countries and the officials, just so that people are more aware. I know there are programs that some of these um, government entities run, but they're really expensive. And so if there's some way we could aggregate and invite them to different meetings and say, okay, how does this work? You know, how do we make sure we comply? And um, how do we all be better uh, aware of what the what the programs are? Because they'll call them sanctions programs in a country. And so it can be a little 
off-putting and a little daunting if you're an organization that hasn't dealt with these organizations in the past. And the last thing you want to do is run afoul of the rules, and it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars um, in fines if you're not aware. Usually those fines would go to bigger companies, but it's... Um, and the last thing I'll say is that if you're trying to build the internet and get more people online, many of our organizations are so well intended. We're just trying to get um, equipment out the door or, or build a bigger, better int uh, internet exchange point in some country. Everything is super well intended. And if you run afoul of these programs, that's where, you know, you could cause a lot of harm to yourself and to your company. Um, and it's really important that we just all are more aware of it. And I'm really grateful, Chris, that you put this panel together. I will stop talking so others can speak. Thank you very much, Jane. Yeah, again, I think as with Fazani's point, it, it, it's helpful and a little daunting to realize the complexity of some of these issues. And it's that complexity which really is, is at the heart of why we kind of need to find, find a, more, a better way through all of this. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Dawit Bakeli from the Internet Society. Um, so Dawit is also online, um, though he's originally from Ethiopia. But Dawit, um, can you share with us a little bit of insight from the technical community perspective? Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, I think the previous speakers uh, have said it. Sanctions are uh, very common. Uh, in fact, uh, they are getting more and more frequent uh, in this world, uh, especially uh, coming from uh, unilateral sanctions coming from Western countries, uh, the EU, uh, the US, uh, and so on, but also the um, uh, multilateral uh, sanctions uh, from the UN, and so on. And uh, they are, uh, well, very often economic sanctions, uh, but sanctions on arms and so on, uh, that have uh, direct and sometimes indirect consequences on uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, Jane mentioned some of the challenges uh, that are that might be indirect uh, to the internet, like uh, importing equipment. Uh, I have had some issues very similar to what she had because uh, you know I was based in Ethiopia and I didn't know anything about US laws and uh, I heard that I am in big problem because uh, I was uh, you know supporting the chapter in Sudan which was under sanction so these are the kind of things that uh, those, those of us who are in a country very far from the country that sanctions uh, don't even think about, but that uh, can be very important. So uh, what are the consequences uh, on the internet? Uh, first of all, the internet is not really uh, done uh, in a national way. So it is not uh, done respecting uh, the national borders. Uh, the inventors of the internet never thought that uh, they had to deal with these kind of issues. So uh, most of uh, you know the the structure of the internet is not really uh, done in that way. So uh, it's not really easy to block just one country or uh, one region. Uh, so how, how is it done? So just to give uh, some technical details of how it is, how this is done, uh, or at least uh, suggested to be done. Uh, for example, recently for Russia, we have seen uh, suggestion to block BGP announcements uh, for Russia. Uh, some even suggested cutting physical connections, uh, revoking CCTLDs, uh, as it has been said earlier. Uh, and by taking back uh, IP numbers uh, given by organizations such as RIPE. Uh, these, all these suggestions have uh, major consequences on the global internet. Uh, the Internet Society identified five critical properties that make the internet the internet that we all enjoy. Uh, these are an accessible infrastructure with a common protocol, an open architecture of interoperable and reusable building blocks, 
a decentralized management and a single distributed routing system, a common global, uh, common global identifiers, uh, and a technology neutral general purpose network. All the methods that have been proposed by proponents of sanctions have many negative impacts on these critical properties. Uh, just to mention a few, the solutions jeopardize the first criterion, which is accessibility of the whole internet infrastructure. Moreover, the decentralized management and single distributed routing system will be questioned since countries will fear that it cannot be used, it, it can be used by their political force. So in summary, uh, some countries will start questioning the current management of the internet, which might push them to create their own independent networks, effectively taking us toward the, the split internet. I will stop here for now, and uh, I hope we'll have more discussion around this. Thank you, Dawit. That's great. And actually, you give me a really good segue to our next speaker, Alexandra Savnan, because I think that that point that you make there um, about undermining trust in the, the global governance processes and incentivizing or inspiring countries to take steps that, that would, in a, sense, in, a sense, in a sense, fragment the internet. Um, is something we're actually already seeing some countries um, doing already. So, um, Alexander, can we get your... Um, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, participating in this panel. Uh, thank you, Chris, the previous speakers. Uh, I would like uh, to mention the following, because uh, any talks of sanctions uh, related to Internet are actually in line uh, what the Russian regime is doing for last years. Uh, for us 10 years and with the uh, uh, introduction of so-called sovereign internet for the last three years. Uh, so uh, uh, all talks, uh, even this uh, legislation was introduced to um, control data flow towards its citizens. Its motivation uh, was kind of our fight for uh, our fight against possible sanctions. So even uh, talks about possibility of sanctioning internet and the mentioned letter by Ukrainian deputy uh, minister is actually uh, like supporting idea of having sovereign internet. So like, like uh, previously for years Putin was dreaming about how to cut his own citizens out of the internet and actually uh, now he have real reason for that. Uh, uh, Really, it's important, I think, uh, from technical point of view, uh, also to discuss consequences, uh, because we have now uh, uh, not just landlocked countries. We have uh, what I call sanction-locked countries, the countries of Central Asia, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan is now surrounded by sanctioned uh, countries, economically sanctioned, but it's also impacting. It's like China, Russia, Afghanistan, Iran, so that's, there is no uh, land way to, to uh, get traffic to them. So uh, if sanctions will affect uh, transport infrastructure, not just core infrastructure, but also transport infrastructure of networks, uh, these countries may suffer. Uh, also, uh, uh, to finish this, uh, my thing, uh, I, I would like to mention that the internet was not uh, designed uh, for uh, executing uh, governmental functions. Uh, protocols does not uh, contain any requirements which governments may, may, may impose, including sanctions and something like. And as far as I remember, I think my neighbors to the left from IAB uh, may remember that uh, uh, there was a statement the internet is for end users. So uh, if uh, we, we are talking about possibility to live free life for end users, any uh, massive sanctions on a core internet or something like may impact end users also. Uh, in this case, I would like to thank uh, Cloudflare, who made really open statements at the beginning of the war, that the information flow is really required to end users in Russia. Uh, and uh, Varzanish uh, mentioned a uh, multi-stakeholder approach uh, on imposing technical sanctions, which was led on Twitter by PCH, as far as I remember, which was saying that sanctions on technical infrastructure uh, may be applied only in case of attack on technical infrastructure. Right. Uh, I think I have something to say about uh, impact of monetary sanctions on this, but I think we can return it. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, that, thank you, Alexander. That's yeah, very yeah, useful insight. I think from from a, an area or a country that's actually a, the target of sanctions um, and and how that can work. Um, our last speaker and sort of concluding our tour de table here is um, Natalia Fodic. Um, and Natalia, I <laughs> misspoke before saying she was academia. She's actually an independent consultant um, these days. So um, Natalia, can you give us, a, I guess, a bit more of a private sector perspective um, on, on um, what's, what's happening here? Thank you so much, Grace. I would like to thank Farza, Farzaneh too for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all. Um, I decided to, because you asked me to give a perspective of Latin America and the Caribbean, I decided to look to one specific country for this panel and I studied it a little bit a really uh, interesting one, which is Cuba, right? Um, so in a lot of the information and things I will say here today come from the book, Cuba's Digital Revolution, which was organized by Ted Hanking and Sara Santa Maria. And also I have talked to a friend of mine, Olga, who actually has a, a chapter in this book and actually has field experience in Cuba so she also told me a bit of her field experience in the country. As Natalie were, and Alexander were saying, uh, well, Natalie mentioned that, you know, people in Brussels should know uh, how the internet works to impose sanctions, but also I will say something along the lines of Alexander, which is people should also know how it actually impacts and users, right? Because this embar, I mean, the US embargo in Cuba has really concrete impacts for the population itself. Uh, and also it actually backfires uh, the fact a lot of times because like if the US mentions that people in Cuba deserve more freedom of expression and in the end of the day, the embargo has a lot to do with um, people being uh, late in accessing the internet and accessing a good quality internet uh, that actually is a contradiction right uh, of course not everything not the fact that cuba has um arrived late to the internet and also the quality of the internet there is uh, lower to compare to the rest of the region is not solely related to the embargo but it has a lot to do with the embargo. Uh, just to give um, a slight, uh, a, a, a quick uh, example, Cuba is ranked, uh, the, the speeds of the internet in Cuba are, uh, it, it's ranked 140, whereas other countries in the region, Uruguay, Brazil, and Jamaica are like 62, 63, 64. So it's like far away, right? Um, and it's also not only a matter of like they arrive late to the internet, but how meaningful that internet is, so the quality of the internet. Um, so it used to be that the whole internet, uh, international connectivity used to be uh, by satellites until 2013. Uh, and then finally they got a submarine cable which was actually dormant for two years, by the way. And then now they finally have arrangements with other, with Google, for example, uh, in 2019, they have an arrangement to have like international uh, cable and also the 3G connectivity has only been um, launched in 2018 and the, um, and, and 4G actually started in 2019. Um, so, um, so as Jane was saying, there are unintended cons consequences of um, having embargoes. So a lot of times uh, these rules of sanctions and embargoes are really not clear enough, which means that companies end up not even daring 
to deal with this country so they have to avoid future trouble right so even if there is like a space for them to it would be they would have some space uh to do uh something in this country they end up not doing it because they don't want to risk uh one example of again going back to cuba uh, microsoft for example could not um really do things in the country so they started using other types of software and started using a lot of chinese equipment and so this is also the type of unintended consequences which is nowadays chinese providers uh are basically really strong in the country and then there is also interesting um things that come up out of it for example they have something famous called el paquete semanal which means the weekly package which is um they they have it's like a, a, a offline internet they have contents that weekly they people distribute these contents in usb drivers and and offline uh versions so it's almost like a uh an offline cdn but that goes uh from people to people uh but actually we although that's a really interesting um you know to a, it's really interesting from an academic point of view and 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 cultural point of view we still want these people to have like real access and real um uh, chance of having access to the whole internet as we all do right uh the uh, those two quick points um one is that um a lot of times embargoes and sanctions also do do not only uh relate to the country the two countries let's say cuba and the us uh itself but also it, it has implications for a third, third country so for example uh germany and other countries that could have provide uh softwares and chipsets to cuba and i'm not doing that because they are afraid of being in trouble with the us right um and um again just going back to how that also relates to having not only access to the internet and good i mean people are also impacted in the sense that they don't have a meaningful connectivity so going back to the the cable uh or a submarine cable example um if you you need to have that to have proper latency and speed so uh, that's how it impacts the individual at the end of the day um i can i will stop here and and we will continue in the debate thank you thanks natalia um i i think you made raised a good point there um it, that relates a bit to what Alexander was saying in terms of risk freezing out opportunity and sanctions and particularly uncertainty around sanctions creating that sense of risk. Um, I think that's that's quite an important point as well. Um, I do want to open the floor if there are, there are comments, but perhaps just before doing that, um, there have been a couple of discussions going on in the chat which are quite interesting. Um, and I know Fazani has been answering them in the chat, but Fazani, do you want, maybe want to just speak briefly um, to those. Um, yeah, thank you, Chris. So uh, there were a few points raised um, about the uh, one of the and uh, one uh, one of the points was about the solutions, and um, uh, I think it's Vyacheslav um, asked uh, whether uh, whether we consider immunity of these. Um, uh, like organizations that provide the critical properties of the internet and like number resources and I can whether we can we can consider uh, you know, get, granting them immunity and uh, yes uh, well uh, in uh, we are doing this research to also like collect the potential solutions and um, then later on work on them as a uh, like a group of like inter uh, with, among the inter internet community to uh, implement these sol solutions or to find the best solution and and implement it. So definitely, uh, immunity is something that we can consider. But there are 
uh, there are of course many barriers and it is not a it is not a new um, a request uh, for for a while for ICANN. They uh, uh, when we were talking about IANA uh, transition um, and during ICANN accountability, uh, we were uh, discussing whether ICANN should be granted immunity, um, and uh, the the community was not. Uh, the, the, a, a large segment of the community was against that because they wanted to hold ICANN accountable by taking them to the court. Uh, so, I mean, in case of, in case of dispute. So, uh, but then, uh, but then the um, the issue of immunity of internet exchange, and then when we talk about immunity, who are we gonna like Im uh, immunize? Is it like? Uh, only the I stars and uh, those that are working on infrastructure, which is like a very um, a complicated word as well, and we can't quite say where is the internet infrastructure. Uh, and um, also, is, is it like IXPs as well, internet exchange points? Are we going to talk about ISPs? So that's one, and that that's one comment. And then the other. Um, the other issue that Marilia Maciel from uh, the Proof Foundation has raised, which I think is a very um, is a very uh, good point, which uh, we have not been discussing a lot. Um, it is not uh, in the scope. I mean, I, I can add a few cases, but it's not in the scope of the research that I'm doing. But Marilia is mentioning that. Uh, how about like trade uh, restrictions? And I got to say that the economic uh, sanctions uh, include sometimes can be like equivalent to uh, trade sanctions. And um, uh, she's asking, do, do panelists believe the current trade restriction affecting uh, semiconductor targeted at China have an interplay with the discussion we are having here? Uh, since semiconductors uh, power uh, many of the equipment, as we mentioned here, for networking and connectivity. And I think that these, like the devices that we um, uh, we use in order to make the internet work and uh, to uh, get the users uh, connected and also maintain their security, um, they are very important. They should be a part of the uh, conversation now, maybe not a part of this uh, research. And um, I remember uh, a few years ago when the U.S. imposed the sanction on, uh, I think it was uh, Huawei, but uh, I, uh, it was one of these Chinese uh, companies that provided Android devices worldwide. And they, when they were sanctioned, Google could not, uh, did not allow important security updates to happen. Uh, because of uh, because of the sanction, and th this is like reported. Um, we, uh, we have to verify it. But so so I think that this is pretty relevant uh, to the discussion, and we need to talk about it when we uh, discuss the sanction regimes. Uh, another point that I wanted to make, and I um, uh, is that so Jane uh, mentioned uh, FedEx and. Uh, UPS and like going and um, ta talking to them about like sending the packages and uh, the devices uh, to sanctioned countries. And I um, uh, something interesting that I always uh, I am uh, Iranian, so I uh, dealt with uh, a lot of sanction issue at the individual uh, level. That whenever I wanted to send something to my uh, family. Um, uh, it, it, a small package, I could not, after a while, I could not do it with DHL uh, because they did not uh, serve that country. And, uh, but, uh, and also I couldn't, I, I can't, I still can't use FedEx here, but what I can use is the UPS, which is the national post. And that's because, and this is this is a controversial thing, and I'm not saying that we should do exactly that, but that's because of a treaty that we have worldwide. So National Post will um, post our devices for you. It might, um, and uh, while the private uh, companies won't. These are the things that we need to think about. I'm not saying that we need a treaty. 
uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not putting that forward as as a solution because I I think that we need the multi stakeholder model, but we also need to consider what sort of what we are like missing out on um, when we are not using the uh, treaties and. Uh, uh, and when we are not considering these multilateral uh, solutions, and, and uh, also um, this this was like one of the, um, the uh, one of the last points that I discussed when when I mentioned that uh, maybe there should be like multilateral or bilateral talks between governments. I'm not uh, saying that we should have a treaty. I just mean that when they are coming up with sanctions. Uh, before imposing it, they can talk to each other in order to have an understanding of because some governments have more experiences, uh, some uh, 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 some governments have like processes that others might want to actually look at and see how they can come up with these uh, sanctions without uh, affecting the in the internet. Also, the UK and the US. This is something that is normal, like cooperation. US and UK have uh, cooperated on. Uh, imposing uh, harmonized uh, sanctions. And one important point that I wanted to make that I think um, uh, Na uh, Natalie uh, mentioned is that when um, like the governments need to know when they are when they are imposing sanctions, they, they need to know what is the internet and what are the internet services that can be sanctioned uh, legitimately and what internet services if they are sanctioned they are going to diminish the presence of people online and uh, I think that is something that we as a uh, internet community we need, we need to work on and uh, we, we need to, because when the sanctions are imposed then even with the exemptions with the licenses and everything the companies are risk averse they have their compliance mechanism in place already. They they rarely change that compliance mechanism because of a license is issued, unless they are taken to court, and you know, uh, which is very difficult. Thank you. Sorry, I went on. No, that's that's great, Basani. Thank you. Um, so immunity and treaties. We're stepping on all the third rails of multi-stakeholder internet governance today. Um, I, I there was a speak a question from the audience but I think he might have left oh, um, uh, so and I know then Alexander and um, Natalie if you that would be great so um, perhaps you and then um, Olga good afternoon dear participant and uh, friends uh, actually I think for uh, having uh, inclusive inter international uh, governance, uh, we need uh, international cooperation among all uh, states and uh, countries. But unfortunately, unilateral coercive measures as well as restrictive and blocking measures against some countries and their digital products made, uh, make it impossible to reach the requested international cooperation. Uh, I think for having uh, meaningful solidarity and cooperation as recommended in the UN uh, documents, uh, we need uh, uh, international uh, cooperation, but unilateral coercive measures uh, don't let uh, it be, it will be uh, reachable. And I think, uh, you know, uh, sanctions are not uh, legal. Uh, but uh, I don't know why some countries uh, insist that uh, they are uh, legal. Uh, I think uh, we cannot react to the behavior of other countries but uh, by illegal means. And uh, from the other side, uh, it is very important to assess humanitarian impact of unilaterally applied measures. Uh, um, and uh, there is another uh, comment uh, that I uh, would uh, to put forward about the sanctions. Uh, um, Iran is a country that suffered from very serious sanctions imposed by the U.S. and 
uh, by some other states. What is special about Iran's uh, situation is that it was under the UN Security Council sanction for 10 years until August two, 2020, which uh, no longer exists. And uh, but uh, some states uh, uh, are still uh, imposing uh, that kind of sanctions that there is no that these, uh, they, they are not uh, existing now. And uh, unfortunately, it has usually been uh, maintained that the unilateral sanctions are imposed by good guys on bad guys or for some uh, supreme, uh, let's say, purpose and with good uh, intentions. But I don't think so that is uh, correct, unfortunately, in reality, that is the people of country who are affected, affected uh, by those, uh, by those uh, kind of sanctions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Olga. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to say that uh, this is a really important topic for discussion uh, and uh, it hasn't been uh, much uh, discussed uh, in any uh, other forums and uh, even at IGFs uh, it has not uh, uh, got uh, any uh, proper attention uh, before, but uh, uh, I think with the developments, uh, uh, with the recent developments uh, in with uh, the war in Ukraine, it is especially important and here I wanted to make uh, two uh, points because first of all I think uh, that was uh, uh, the right uh, uh, response uh, from uh, RIPE and CC and ICANN when they refused uh, to block uh, uh, CCTLD uh, and because this is the technical layer and uh, that has been uh, the uh, matter of principle that uh, this is something which has to stay untouchable. But uh, the second point is that uh, it is... Uh, I don't think uh, the Russians can use this argument about uh, sanctions uh, being uh, um, not being efficient or that they shouldn't be in place just uh, because uh, they create uh, some uh, uh, uncomfortable situation uh, uh, for uh, Russian end users or because they are supporting uh, Putin's politics because uh, this is not the case. I think this is the huge uh, failure of uh, the Russian civil society and uh, digital rights defenders uh, if they could not uh, for many years uh, reach the point that their internet is free enough so that uh, uh, they have uh, proper access to information. During all these years it has been happening that the uh, internet space has been limited uh, uh, and resources have been blocked one after another but uh, still that was uh, like they did not do enough for, for to stop that and now when the sanctions are in place it is just this argument that uh, you will just support in Putin politics which is uh, which is uh, I would say cynical to use because uh, even I, I totally support these sanctions because not even uh, thousands of these sanctions they can't bring back not a single life that was lost they can't bring back you the house which has been destroyed to the ground and uh, this is uh, this is something at least which is probably supposed to show that uh, there is uh, some element of suffering when you make other people suffer so much because of your actions so um, I would say that uh, sanctions they are good in this case and that's uh, not the problem of the international community that the Russian end users have problems with access to some uh, services or to some platforms especially given that uh, those platforms have been uh, specifically already um, blocked and uh, uh, they were li left without the access by the Russian government so and I'm sorry this is very emotional for me because uh, because I'm Ukrainian and I, I can't have a different opinion on Thank you very much. Um, I have one more speaker from the floor, if just a very short intervention, because I think we're going to have to move to a, if not closing round, at least the, the sort of final section. Um, but please. Uh, for the record, Andrew Sherbovich, McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Uh, I'd like to uh, disagree with that previous position about the ability of internet sanctions because without the internet uh, people in Russia will thrown into the governmental propaganda and there will be 100% supporters of the war internet allows for those who are uh, free mind thinking who are against the war to raise their hand or maybe to listen or to support even people in Ukraine. That's uh, your position. Internet allows people to speak to or to think freely 
without impact of governmental propaganda and the, the you know the issue of propaganda military propaganda is one of the crucial uh, things is uh, the disrupting people's heads in in the country and the the number of people supporting of the war raising because of the work of the pro, pro governmental propagandists and this is the will will be true impact of this kind of sanctions so it is not uh, my position is not possible to impose this in in this case i am uh, 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 totally against the war i am uh, have a deep uh, deep condolences with the people in ukraine but uh, it it is the position thank you very much okay thank you very much um so alexander and, and natalie uh yeah okay uh thank you very much uh in response to Olga, uh, now I belong mostly to civil society in Russia. And believe me, normal civil society is really ashamed with going on. We always think, really, did we do what we can do to stop Putin during these years? But you may see here on the Internet Governance Forum there, there is a fake civil society. Gongos and, Zal, uh, and others, it's really difficult to work. But again, we are really normal civil society really supports Ukrainian and their struggle and it's still trying to do something even in Moscow. Uh, actually I came from uh, civil society, from all technical, from engineering uh, and I also really uh, appreciate and support Ukrainian engineers who restoring internet connectivity for Ukrainians all this time. I'm very carefully watching what's going on especially with internet infrastructure internet resources uh, and uh, I really really glad that people could restore something uh, but this is also tells us what which story internet is really resilient uh, yeah you see that for years Putin tried to block resources and actually they, they were restoring uh, e even with war times uh, until very last times when the Putin starts uh, destroying energetical infrastructure of Ukraine the civil infrastructure uh, internet, uh, internet was working well uh, we have uh, really two examples it's like territory of Ukraine well in energetic infrastructure uh, energy infrastructure and community infrastructure will be destroyed and also in this country there is a whole region uh, where to cut off people from access of information uh, there was complete shutdown on an uh, um, energetic i've met a few people from tigray here so that's uh, they really sad uh, so in 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 this case uh imposing sanctions might be well likes being discussed well will be uh, not effective in stopping war until uh, it was sanctions will completely destroy infrastructure uh, Yes, I, I, I really can't believe that, uh, well, internet sanction can stop Putin be just because I live in this country and understand how he thinks. Uh, but back maybe to trade sanctions um, and uh, economic sanctions. Like, a co like content blocking, uh, in Russia, um, uh, when it was introduced, uh, operators tried to block much more than was required by government, even by regime, just not to be punished. Uh, Currently, we see that uh, the most dangerous sanction on the internet is actually secondary sanctions by the United States or by other countries. So, in many cases, and like maybe Jane said, uh, that a, a bit of uh, additional restrictions are Im uh, imposed by private companies just to feel them safe in their governmental uh, uh, environment. And uh, it's also uh, may hit not 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 just Russians who support Putin, not just Russians who doesn't support Putin, but still live in Russia, not just Russians who live outside Russia, but also, well, somebody else who have no relations neither to Putin nor to war. Uh, and, and in this case uh, is also what I was uh, trying to tell, that fake civil society uh, from Russia who's uh, trying to inflate here on this forum uh, ideas of internet governance, uh, the same idea that's uh, trying to bring uh, much more into sanctions will inflate ideas of human rights and European values. Uh, uh, it, it's really sad, uh, sad to see because, well, even, even still being in Russia, I believe in, uh, and Russia, well, uh, was ex uh, kicked out of uh, uh, Council of Europe 
uh, I still believe that a lot of people uh, of people in Russia believe in European values and while well, trying to protect human rights even in this environment. So uh, again, thinking about sanctions, uh, still think that uh, um, uh, trying to provoke you on the sanctions is deflating your values. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think. It's, it's really important and I'm glad we've been able to, to talk about the events that are happening right now and I, I think that's um, wonderful to hear, to be able to hear from different, uh, different perspectives from people so close to what's going on. Um, I think there's probably a limit to what we can do in an IGF, particularly in a, a session like this. Um, and I would like to steer us perhaps a little back towards what solution possibilities are there um, that we could look at, particularly in relation to the risks that these pose, these san sanctions pose to the global internet. And Natalie, perhaps, I mean, I know you had some reactions to other comments as well, but perhaps if I could ask you to yeah, reflect to on that. Uh, on the, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, without any doubt, um, I mean, sanctions are always a um, political instrument. Um, and so um, whenever uh, policymakers, politicians are considering sanctions, um, they need to take into account um, proportionality uh, as, a, as a principle. Um, but of course, more in general, um, the overall impact. And then of course you can have different views on, okay, do you believe that this impact is something that we would like to see? And I think that was the discussion that we had just seen. And of course, I also have my private opinion about this. Um, and I think the war is terrible and, and really all my sympathy for, for Ukraine. Um, it's... Um, but what I find really important with sanctions is that people who are about to take decisions on sanctions, that they do make those decisions um, made based on sort of fully understanding the impact. And that is what I believe is now lacking. And Fasani, you made a suggestion that perhaps the multi-stakeholder community need to build that better understanding. And I think that is a, a very generous offer. Um, just to share with you sort of our internal thinking, when we are sort of going over the current sanctions and um, sort of taking all our policy frameworks into account, we started with um, sort of this, this public core of the internet and sort of looking at the technical layer and then thinking about, okay, well, perhaps we should make an exemption for RIPE NCC that is based in the Netherlands and then sort of go for that. Um, so perhaps an overall exemption for regional internet registries around the world. But then you come to, okay, what about other actors? I mean, you mentioned Cloudflare. I had a conversation with Cloudflare in the beginning of the war and I um, also sort of listen to their considerations and um, actually ask them like do you have an exemption under the OFAC sanctions uh, and they said yeah we believe we do have an exemption and so it's sort of where I don't have the full understanding of sort of who are all the who are all the players who should we sort of how should we identify them in a way that is also clear for sort of lawmakers who are drafting the sanction legislation? So I think really help from the multi-stakeholder community would be really, um, really welcome, uh, including in sort of understanding um, what is the landscape of the different actors, but then also what is the impact? Um, because, of course, I talked about the technical layer, but if you are to, if sanctions are to impact the technical layer, that also has impact on uh, individual users. So it's, um, but there are other sanctions that could have impact on individual users. Um, and sort of, 
making that kind of mapping, I think, would be really beneficial and would be uh, fruitful for, for discussions, um, in our case, again, in, in Brussels. And I just wanted to get back to one point that Jane made, and that was sort of how about um, small companies, small NGOs, who want to do good and who to liaise with within the government. Um, I mean, I was being introduced as a cyber ambassador. Um, I think, in general, cyber ambassadors are on the side of uh, sort of the, the continuity of the internet. And um, so, and, and I think that there are more sort of cyber diplomats nowadays around the world because we have more sort of discussions about. Uh, responsible state behavior online and so I think uh, from a very pragmatic point of view reach out to ministries of foreign affairs and to the cyber diplomats at the ministry of foreign affairs to yeah to sort of get a better understanding okay thanks very much Natalie um, we actually have five minutes left so I, I do I, can I first Malcolm I just want to quickly give at least um, a Jane, Dawit and Natalia a chance to have just a final word, maybe in almost tweet format, but um, perhaps J J Jane, um, you want to go first? You bet. If the internet is a tool for democratization, we really are going to have to think hard about um, limiting it in other places because we could have an adverse impact on democracy. And also we create some very interesting um, black market and gray market supply chains when we put in sanctions. And I'm all for sanctions in some instances, but you've got to be really careful there. And the last thing I would say is I really loved Farzane's idea that Natalie just um, repeated, which is let's map the value chain and let's map the um, unintended consequences over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Dawit, do you have a brief last comment? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to join uh, uh, the, the other speakers to say that we have to be very careful when we think of sanctions because we don't know exactly what the impact is. Uh, but uh, I think there are many reasons why we should really avoid sanctions on the internet. Uh, we haven't discussed much uh, here, but uh, they often don't even work. Uh, and then uh, we have said it, uh, they don't, the impact, in fact, uh, people we don't want to be impacted, like the end users we want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, speak about, uh, you know, uh, against the governments that we sanction, for example. And most of all, it is a major threat on the internet model. So I would like uh, to urge uh, those uh, countries and organizations that uh, uh, think about uh, sanctions really to think about uh, the impact on everybody before taking this important measure. Thank you. Thank you, Dawit. Um, Natalia, final tweet. <laughs> Final tweet. Uh, well, first of all, thank you again. This was really interesting. And well, lastly, just a quick anecdote of the conversation I had with this friend that actually lived in Cuba for many years, years ago. She said uh, the following phrase, uh, the regime, the regime, I mean, the, she meant the Cuban regime, doesn't feel it that much. Who feels it in the end of the day is the people, the end users. So that's just like a real anecdote from someone that lived there and saw that the impact of the embargo was affecting end users more than anything else, more than the regime itself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, I can probably, if you've got a almost tweet format. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I know we're out of time. I, I just wanted to emphasize from a business perspective because business is usually placed in actually implementing the sanctions that have been imposed. Um, I think that one thing that I think we can agree on on all sides of this very difficult debate is that the, it's undesirable that sanctions should extend more broadly in practice than is intended in policy. Um, it is very difficult for business when sanctions are directed to entities that are impossible to identify because it's about the practical control rather than identify of entities which could be indeterminate that's a problem um, and the I, I would like to commend the 
European Union's approach in exempting broadly a category, namely transit between the Union and Russia, where that was not intended to be covered, and then specifically targeting the blocking of particular media stations. Now, I know that there are those in great friends of mine in the technical community that are very critical of the blocking, and, and honestly, I'm, I think this is the first time I've ever spoken in favour of any internet blocking measure um, on, at a network level. But it is better to be precise about what it is that you intend and then accept the political consequences of that than have something broad where you may cause a broader harm than you actually intend to do. Um, so I would encourage others that are using sanctions um, to follow that principle. Thank you, Malcolm. Actually, that's, I think, quite a good note for us to begin to wrap up. I mean, I think it, it highlights the sort of the marching orders we have, and as Natalie was saying and others, of, of mapping the value chain of pulling together a, a multi-stakeholder effort, probably, um, to try and create this information that will be of use in creating more precision um, in what is a diplomatic tool, which we at the IGF probably are not going to be able to rule in or out, but at least we can do what we can to um, make it less likely to jeopardize the global internet. Um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat here. Um, if anyone on in, in the chat is interested in being part of that kind of effort, please feel free to reach out. Others in the room, if you'd like to talk to me, um, I'm here, you can grab a business card. Um, I think this is something that would be good to do between now and the next IGF. It's, it's not something that we can just sort of put on the back burner indefinitely. Um, so I hope we were able to start, start getting some momentum here. Um, I would really like to thank all of our speakers today. Um, for those here in the room, Natalie and Alexander, um, online to Natalia, to Jane, to Dawit, and of course to Fazani. Thank you for the work you're doing on the research there. Um, and thank you all for being here. I look forward to speaking more about it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm